should have. I was like, I should have. Now I'm open. <laughs> All right, well, whatever. Are we live? You know, yes. You know what I did today instead of... Uh, it's the same thing I did yesterday instead of looking at my notes. While I should have been working, should have been working, quote unquote. I uh, just looked at Warhammer models. Nice. Again. Nice. And I think I have decided... Do you, you like? Yes. I think I've decided if, one of these days, if I'm ever going to get anything from Age of Sigmar from a start collecting box, it's got to be the Corrin, like, uh, <laughs> guys. They're, they're just too cool. They're I just too told you that one. <laughs> <laughs> They're just too cool. If, if, if Jack is offered the opportunity <laughs> to buy anything like <laughs> corn related, <laughs> go for it. I They're haven't really cool. dug into Jack's affinity with the blood god. It's just cool. Not quite I don't know. It out, you know. It's just neat. <laughs> like I don't know. I was like, oh, you know, like the uh, the uh, what are the guys with the moons and the mushrooms? And oh the, yeah, the gloom spike. Gloom spike gets. gets. They're cool. You know. Uh, I don't know. And then I was like, forty k. I was like, Zeno's armory would be cool. And then I was like. You just can't beat. You just can't beat like world leaders. You can't beat the corn stuff. It's just yeah. cool. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, folks. A long time ago, real heads will remember. We did a political compass uh, 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 for chaos, chaos gods, gods <laughs> thing on the show, and corn was top left. It was off left. So you know, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, so Jack's a Stalinist. <laughs> 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 Listen, guys, I just think their uniforms are cool. Um, all right, we're back. Um, Wow, stressful week, huh? Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, world kind of going nuts. Welcome, though, to the show where you won't find takes, I think. Yeah. Am I correct? No, no takes, takes here. No takes. Yeah. We yeah. have nothing to say. <laughs> we recognize our own um, inability to comment on anything happening exactly. in the world. Oh, we're just not going to try. Yeah. Go somewhere yeah. else. I will say, last night, though, the one thing I'll say is that, like... You always get a lot of hindsight bias whenever anything's like this happened where it's like, oh, well, I should have seen this coming or, you know, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And there was some of that stuff with like the whole nuclear scare thing that happened that day when Putin was like, hey, but what if I, you know, what if? You never but, know. But we've got a button as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't think we don't. And uh, I realized that like whenever anyone, whenever anything like that happens, whenever Trump uses the word nuclear or whenever, you know, Putin is like, I but we still have the weapons. Every like a lot of people tend to be like, no one's come on guys, no one's actually gonna come on. Did you really think that was gonna happen? Come on, that was just you know scare tactics, blah 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 blah. And it's like even if that's true, which like yeah, it's probably true. Like I experienced on that day a great deal of dread, and I think that it's pretty hard to uh, uh, say how that affects people's psyches when something like that gets uh, tossed around, because I don't think, obviously, like, there hasn't been very long in the human experience where there are weapons and the potentiality to destroy everything as we know it. And, you know, regardless of whether or not it's, like, a rational thing to believe, hey, bombs could drop at any moment. They might not. They might. It's a pretty horrifying thing to just hear, like, used as, like, ah, it might happen, like, as a scare tactic. So rationality these days, eh, done with it. Leave it in, uh, you know, 18th century. We're done with rationality. <laughs> Yeah, if a comprehensive study of history teaches us anything, the desire, like a conscious desire to not do something, <laughs> very rarely prevents that thing from happening, yeah. nonetheless. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then there are times people have avowedly not wanted to do something right yeah. up until the point where they find themselves doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We were talking about that, about like the English Revolution, the French Revolution. It's like nobody was like, hey, let's kill these monarchs. Let's do it. Let's do it right now. So, you know, I don't know. These things kind of just tend to happen. Not trying to freak anybody out about nuclear war. Just saying, even if it never happens, uh, it's hard to quantify the amount of dread that that puts on people's psyches. Even when it's just casually like, we got a button. It's like, oh, fuck. Like, just, yeah, I don't know. It's stressful. Yeah. You can't, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Tactically, don't forget about that. Yeah. So, yeah. The number of times, um, this is a segue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Let's hear it. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Once again, the listener is already aware ahead of time because they clicked on the video uh -huh. or on the podcast. Uh, but this week we read Designing Freedom by Stafford mm. Beer. And um, it's quite a good degree of relevance in this text mm. to a s scenarios in which our um, sort of control, our ability to even understand and comprehend the world around us and therefore our ability to control the world around mm. us has been taken away from us mm. um, and our freedom is heavily curtailed. Mm. But there are p portions of this essay when you're reading it, you're like, what does he mean when a system, <laughs> how, how do you imagine, it's quite easy to imagine like a mathematical sort of like abstracted model. Okay, at a certain point it falls into crisis. But I think we've, we, when we were talking about this beforehand, we've sort mm. of said, well, 
what does a social system becoming catastrophic look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the catastrophic outcomes. <laughs> Fuck. The buttons. The buttons. The buttons. The buttons. Folks. The buttons. <laughs> the football. The nuclear. The nuclear football. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Bombs. Huh? It's still horrifying that they exist. <laughs> so you know what are you gonna do? Anyway, Dan, you are correct on a suggestion from last week's uh, guest, June Reith. We finally read slash listened to slash read uh, Design and Freedom, Stafford Beer, series of radio lectures that he delivered at a point in time, I believe the early 70s. Yeah, seven, 73. 73, yeah. So after uh, yeah after his experience in Chile. Um, and it's really interesting. I had tried to listen to this a couple of times a while ago and only gotten through like the first two for whatever reason. Um, I think because it, it, it's relatively hard to follow at least it was for me i don't know if you felt like this when you're just listening to it so it was good to actually just sit down and have a goal for myself and be like all right i'm gonna actually try to understand what he's saying because it's like when you're listening to him great voice uh they're very entertaining but it's also like what is he talking two guys on poles with like plastic <laughs> and a cat and like a tennis ball what yeah it's very easy to, with anything like that it's very easy to lose the mm. try you lose one strain of thought or lose the comprehension of the argument as it's unfolding so it, it, bear, it bears uh, reading and it bears careful reading. But fortunately, it's quite a short piece. So if anybody mm. wants to go out, go out and find the audio mm. versions. Go out and find the digital version. Go out and buy the book if you yeah, want. Indeed. Uh, it's relatively short. And with a very small amount of deciphering work, you can really... Um, one, the listener will inevitably and invariably benefit greatly from engaging with this text as i think mm. we both have yeah um so Absolutely. it gets a gets a however many thumbs up you want from me <laughs> yeah. Ten, five bags of popcorn. <laughs> um yeah it's funny right because like what is his goal i guess here it's first of all to warn people of this impending collapse that he sees which i think we can talk about that in a bit but then it's also to be like well why is this collapse of our institutions happening and it's getting people to think in terms of systems. And then it's about rethinking those systems. And I guess like a main point of that that he says early on, right, is like thinking about systems as systems and not as entities. Because like there's a very, a lot of the language in this seems very like proto-American libertarian. You know what I mean? Like where he's like the big bureaucratic institutions, colossus on the humble man trying to just do his Rousseauian thing or whatever. Um, but yeah, he does recognize, like, if you're actually going to diagnose these problems with our institutions, you can't see them as, like, the big government. Um, in spite of that, you have to see them as sy systems that we are part of and that kind of operate just like us in a weird way. Um, and very refreshing. Not, not Obviously not overtly socialist in any way, but um, could be. Yeah, <laughs> if yeah, you yeah. just put that word in there a couple times, it could be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's an important point to say that that's one of the basic premises, isn't it, that no thing, no entity, no organization in the world is a static thing. Mm. Um, it's uh, a collection of very many moving parts and the way that those things interact end up contributing to the th what the thing is that we're engaging with. And the other point that can attendant with that is the idea that all of what appears to be the attributes of a system are actually outcomes of... Mm what that system is doing kind of thing. So like everything, yeah, everything that results from a social system in existence is the result of the way that system functions. Mm. And so we need to dig a lot deeper into the functioning of systems um, and the relationships internal to them and our relationships to them um, to work out the full social implications, I guess. Yeah. And it's interesting because last week, ostensibly, or not last week, two weeks ago, when we did the talk with June, we... She suggested a book by two people named Matron and Varela called The Tree of Knowledge. And it was a little hard to get, understand what they were getting at. But um, Beer here kind of makes one of their main ideas very clear, the idea of autopoiesis. Because like when we were reading that book, it was, I was really confused and put off because it seemed like their, this idea of autopoiesis was just like a system that's capable of like reproducing. And I was like, well, okay, like that's what makes... Like, life, that's what makes a system. I don't really get it. But beer here really makes the point that, like, no, it's about a system is one that, like, is able to continue itself, basically. And that doesn't necessarily, like, mean that the system is good or bad, right? It's just, like, 
yeah, capitalism is a system that does this. Capitalism is able to keep itself going, whether or not you think of like, you know, final breakdown theory or anything like that. Um, so that that was like very, very interesting because he basically says when we're trying to design better systems, read like socialist systems, we need to make systems that are not, ne not necessarily self-regulating, but ones that are like able to maintain themselves dynamically and not just be too rigid because that's again like his big thing right is that like modern day big colossal institutions bearing down on the humble man are just too bureaucratically like ossified and rigid and are only uh interested in maintaining themselves and nothing else at the expense of themselves so it's like you know purpose of a system is what it does these bureaucracies maintain themselves that's what they do they don't necessarily follow out the mission goal which is like make life better for people right yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's telling what he's telling us is um, it's possible for us to design systems that have outcomes that we want to have them have kind of thing. Mm. Um, we can design systems that promote freedom, hence the title <laughs> Designing Freedom. But there's a really interesting implication in that. And maybe we'll come back to it multiple times as we go through this text, I guess, is that what you were saying before, it's not just like there's a huge amount of like a degree of moralism throughout this text, right? Yeah, you can yeah, imagine yeah. A, an introductory text on cybernetics being very mechanistic and mechanical, and there is lots of technical language, and you can, if you want to, break systems down into sort of like mechanical flowcharts and depict systems in that way. But there is underlying this, or right, even like um, overlaying the whole text, this sort of like really heavy moral weight that hangs over it all. And you were saying before, like. There is a degree to which it feels very libertarian in some mm. respects, which we shouldn't. I mean, we're in favor hey, of. Hey, liberty, I guess. Is good. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but also, it's not like he just wants to set humans free. You know, <laughs> it's not like there's a system that's curtailing them, weighing them down, and if only they were left to their devices, mm. they would flourish. You know, it's rather we need to. We can design a system that has freedom as an outcome. And so it's not um, it's not about removing all controls and constraints on our behavior because he seems to think that that kind of what we'd think of as that kind of like fully uh, libertarian, mm. um, fully free human being, that notion of freedom that's attendant with sort of libertarianism or maybe even some strands of anarchism just doesn't exist it's like he just yeah. th he just thinks it's a, a total fiction and we're laboring under the belief that um that kind of freedom is possible but what we need to do is risk attempting to create a system that has freedom as an outcome and he says at the end he says it's kind of a risky proposition but we mm. have to mm. take that risk yeah um, and so what he's really doing is setting out how one might go about doing that yeah and it's funny in the way that he does that it's very like it's, I don't know, he, he is a weird dude. <laughs> he's, he's, like, he's a very weird guy because it's like, there's something very enthralling about the way he wrote this. And I guess it might be that it's written to be like spoken, I guess. But through a lot of it, there's this weird dissonance between like, you know, doing the right thing and this moralism uh, and like not comfortable with using the word like revolution in its kind of like you know lefty sense like he at one point says something like the you know the revolutionary as well say that this is bad but at the same time putting something forward that's like mind-bogglingly revolutionary like and he'll say that too he'll say it like some points like there's a line that like i had heard from this before but it's just buried in the middle of a paragraph and it's something along the lines of like every time we hear uh, a proposal that vows to destroy society as we know it, we should have the courage to say, thank God. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, man. It's like, that rocks. That's really, really cool. But it's funny because it's like, here's someone who had this experience, fresh off this experience with Allende in Chile, right? That ended it with, you know, so many of his friends just being murdered or imprisoned, right? And like, it must've been very strange because I don't know if he thought of himself, he definitely didn't think of himself, right, as like a technocrat, but he was kind of a, in a weirdly unique position to kind of like fiddle with things and see how much liberty a like well-meaning actor can insert into a modern capitalist system. And it leads to this in really interesting place where it's like reform or revolution isn't even the question. It's like, how do we destroy everything? But like, hey, don't worry, guys, like it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> One could approach this text in a really uncharitable way mm. and be like, 
yeah, this is where's this is just reformism. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Where's the where's the references to class conflict? You yeah. know, he, he <laughs> we're at the like, Soviets. Like, like, like <laughs> maybe the most difficult or maybe the most problematic aspect of what he's saying in this text from a kind of like revolutionary or Marxist perspective is his relationship to the state because he just seems to mm. say that the state is a system which um, ought to ensure liberty for the people who live sure. in it. Sure. And he's he's sort of basically just saying that the state is failing in this, this aspect, you know. Um, so there really isn't any recognition or discussion of the state or uh, class forces or the nature of capitalism. Mm. So if one were to be a sort of un uncharitable, dour, curmudgeonly <laughs> Marxist and just sort of like, you could just read it and just berate it throughout. But mm. as you say... It is actually an incredibly radical proposal, yeah. and there are lines in it that you're just like, no, this, this, this is, this is, this, what you are proposing. He 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 knows full well that he's mm. proposing, um, very radical, uh, a, a proposing a very radical prescription for what needs to happen, mm. um, and it almost feels like there's really no need that, it's in some ways, from from the position that he's speaking to the audience that he's speaking, there's no need for him to have some of those sort of like uh marxist shibboleths or sure, socialist yeah. shibboleths you know it's like he, he knows what he's saying yeah. um and what what occurred to me because initially i started out from that what wanting to be slightly critical aspect mm. um but what occurred to me is you could just look at this and be like he's just describing how you would organize a classless society yeah like yeah. you and if you just approach it from that perspective and sort of like okay take a few of these few of these lines and a few of these sort of like liberal tendencies and just sort of like put them aside. Mm. But um, there's absolutely no reason to, to. Doubt his uh, street cred. Yeah, quite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he it's... definitely, definitely, we'll, 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 he definitely deserves a place in the pantheon of like big yeah. beards, you know, like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the biggest of the beards. Uh, yeah, June said something really interesting the other day when she was like, "But the main question is, how do you do this?" without everybody starving to death <laughs> because it's like, yeah. you know, he does say, you're right to say that he gets like, you know, the state stuff because at some point he's like, and there will be bureaucracies and institutions that we currently have that will be completely, um, uh, what's the word? Like opposed to uh, what we're trying to do here. And the answer is to smash them. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll just smash them. I'll smash the United States military. Thank you so much. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, as Marxists or whatever, everybody wants to be like, state, that's a class thing. Can't use state or whatever. Or like the Lasallians, everybody's a Lasallian but me. But like, I don't know. At a certain point, it's like, how are you going to balance that with like, a reasonable transition to something resembling a classless society, right? Because one could imagine if you were to just take the curmudgeonly, like, we can't use any of these institutions, burn it all down from the bottom up, uh, we'll build something new, uh, who, how people get food. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not trying to come yeah, yeah, across yeah. like a reformer guy here or mm -hmm. anything like that, because indeed the question remains of like, how do you smash these things? But it's also like, hey, food's good. So There's another way I was looking at this, which is like, how like nobody experiences like it's all good and well being like it's class it's class it's yeah. class like but nobody who experiences class in that sort of pure marxist way anymore like mm. where even mm. are the bourgeoisie yeah like, yeah that's an excellent um, point they're sort of very well hidden and disguised and the the sort of like the mechanisms that are in place support their their ongoing existence but you don't you don't mm. You don't meet the person who's actually benefiting from the exploitation that you go through every day mm. when you go to work kind of thing. Um, and we need some other language to propagandize our politics. I think and an and I think the language in this is really excellent because who, do, who doesn't feel the constraining of their freedom? Mm. Absolutely. Who, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't... I mean, he, he, he put... Actually, he does... Explain some people. There are people who there is a reason why people are very committed to the system and the way it functions as it's as it is at the moment because all of their thinking and all of their trajectory through life has been predicated on certain outcomes and they're sort of working toward those outcomes. Mm. But it's a very powerful language and it's one that we might be very fruitful if a left wing, a live left wing working class political project mm. is to. Um, 
buys the, from yeah, the ashes. The I mean, yeah, it's the language of liberty, right? Yeah. And that's something that's been very lost. It's funny because you get the sense that Marx really liked this idea of liberty quite a bit. And it's almost kind of weird because it's like, obviously it's, you know, it's equality and it's liberty. And the left wing is generally much more associated with equality than it is liberty for whatever reason. But yeah, it's interesting. It's like, it almost comes down to like, at a certain point, if there's somebody on the left, I feel like who's like really into liberty or something, it's almost because they're trying to not make a moral argument. Like, I don't know, when you hear a lot of the like equality arguments, it can kind of come across as like a little bit moralizing or whatever. And then it you, you kind of gets a bit reactionary, but I don't know, <clears throat> you're absolutely right to say that like equality and liberty as language used on the left are both equally important. And it's like, if we just see the idea of equality, obviously we're not actually seeding it to the right, then it's like, you know, well, that's not great. And obviously, Stafford Beer is not like a right winger or anything. But yeah, the the language in this is one that I think is uh, could be a lesson to a lot of people because everybody just wants liberty. Everybody wants to be equal, but like, hey, everybody also wants to just do their own thing, right? So, yeah. I uh, he has a bunch of doodles in this, mm -hmm. um, and one of the doodles is kind of like a way of describing basic variety attenuation, but basic just like um, cybernetics, basically, I guess, right? It's like on one end, there's the system that you're regulating. On the other end, there's the regulator itself, whatever regulatory body this is. Um, and he basically tries to make the point in a lot of this that technology is so good, technology great, technology is the best thing ever maybe, but we're using it in completely the wrong way. And in between both ends of this loop, like he talks about the different ways that variety gets amplified and attenuated when moving towards the system being regulated and away and towards the regulator, basically. Like, uh, there, you can't have to back up, I guess, because it's this whole idea of Ashby's law of requisite variety, which we've spoken about kind of quite a bit on the show so far, which is basically like if you want to regulate a system in the best possible way, you need as much variety in the regulatory apparatus as there is. Um, in the system that's being regulated. But I thought it was really interesting and that's how he basically says that that's kind of not possible most of the time. Like you're, you're never really gonna make that happen. And he uses that example of the department store where he's like, the perfectly functioning department store would have one member of staff for every customer that comes in the door. But I really appreciate the like, you know, uh, maybe like more mature understanding of like, but that's not gonna happen. And that's not what's gonna happen in any of our institutions either, uh, except for when we reach high communism perhaps. But it's, he basically just says like, you're never gonna have enough variety in your regulator to regulate the system being regulated. So then he goes on to basically have this whole talk about, well then <clears throat> how do you attenuate variety going to the regulator and how do you amplify it going away? Um, and I don't know, I don't know how you felt about that, but I felt like that was one of the more enlightening parts of this whole thing about like, okay, how is it that socialist systems regulate variety? And it's really, really interesting because I've been using that as like a critical lens for a lot of different things, even when just looking at capitalism, because like, it's really astonishing the ways in which capitalism does that, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I have a whole spiel like about how this works with fundamental principles, but I feel like I need to take a breath before mm -hmm. I get into that. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting point you make that there's a certain extent to which you can't supply enough attenuating variety to offset the natural variety in the system. Mm. Um, so yeah, any any system naturally creates a certain amount of variation. It confronts the, or, or rather, the the system is confronted with um, what he calls like perturbances, mm. right? Like there is a natural state in which a system wants to be in. Uh, there's a well-organized and ordered um, department store. And then the customers are all these sort of like <laughs> perturbances, sort of bombarding the system kind of thing. And the department store, or the various ways in which the department store is organized, is designed to sort of like offset that incoming variety of all of these customers with a sort of self-generated variety internal to the system kind of thing and then he, he introduces this various different language about the system and the length of time it takes for the system to see off 
all of these external perturbances mm -hmm. and he calls it the the relaxation time of the system how long does it take the system to return to its natural state um of relatively well ordered and organized functioning i guess um and what i was making reference to before he talks about like systems falling into a sort of catastrophic spiral where they just become more and more dysfunction until they completely fall apart and cease to work at all. And the point he makes is that like, all what you need to do is get to the point where your system can get back to its relaxation time faster than all of the sort of external uh, perturbances come in and sort of fluster it again kind of thing so it's not necessarily matching variety for a variety exactly but all you, what you really need to do is forestall this sort of like collapse this mm. catastrophic collapse of the system because it just c can no longer function anymore mm. um but yeah this distinction between ver systemic variety variety in the system or uh, coming into the system and then the attenu the sort of the variety which is used to offset that incoming variety, right? So he talks about all these ways in which it's possible to control and control the con and curtail the variety of the system. But he makes the point that a lot of these are actually detrimental to our freedom, kind of thing. And he, I mean, his ultimate example is the metaphor of shooting the cat, right? Um, <laughs> which without going through the whole tennis metaphor ball, of the tennis elastic. balls and the elastic and the, um, go and listen to the first lecture, read the first lecture. Uh, it's there. You'll, you'll see it. Um, in that metaphor, the cat is the thing perturbing the system and the sort of like the, 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 the resort of the heavy handed controller sort of like the corporation i think he refers to banks for some reason the the, the, the preferred outcome of the uh -oh. sort of the, the preferred reaction of the bank is to just shoot the cat you know mm. it's like just get rid of the variety perturbing our perfect system but mm. he talks about some less slightly less draconian ones that would be quite familiar with like um installing management right you install mm. a layer of management which cont controls the people who work within the system or you set all these strict rules and regulations for how people are to behave so there is a way in which you can in a very uh dictatorial way almost attempt to control the the external variety of the system mm. but he leans much more toward the variety attenuation inside of the system itself like how can you actually adapt your system so that it has more variety um and these are the much more liberatory ways of organizing a system mm. to give the system enough variety to see off the perturbances, I suppose, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and one way to do that is to just be dynamic, yeah. right? He talks about how planning is a form of variety attenuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. That was, like, really enlightening, just like, oh, it absolutely is, because you're predicting the future, and it's never going to be perfect. It's going to be a little fuzzy. But, hey, you prepared yourself a little bit, so your relaxation time or whatever is different. But also, I mean, I think about, like, the relaxation time, if you have a truly dynamic system, it's almost, it's like, it's almost like your system won't be returning to the same state, if that makes sense. Yeah it will have adapted and it will be dynamic and will be able to change. I don't know if that's crazy, but like... No, that's right, because he talks mm -hmm. about the... I think when he's talking about um, viable systems later mm -hmm. on, which is the language that we're vaguely familiar with, yeah. we have talked about <laughs> viable systems and his viable <laughs> systems model before. He talks about viable systems as being those ones that can... The dynamism comes from their ability to evolve, right? So it's sort of like there is this ongoing process of learning to deal with the input variety i guess mm. and he talks about sort of breaks down there being two different types of viable systems right there's the ones that based on their their um systemic knowledge they know how to deal with a certain set of circumstances but then there are ultra stable systems that can adapt yeah. to defend against uh, circumstances that they're not even familiar with haven't come across in the past kind of mm. Yeah, and that kind of gets into the more, like, vaguely lefty kind of stuff in this. But I want to say, like, first of all, like, you're right. The, one of the best ways to just attenuate variety to the regulators is just get rid of the variety you don't need. It's like you don't need all information all of the time to make a decision about, like, you know, putting on your shoes. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's just like black boxing. It's just like forget about it. The information you don't need, you don't need it. You can overlay this systemic model on things that are very different. But if you just have the information you need, it's fine. You'll be totally fine. 
Um, and yeah, that kind of led me to try and apply these ideas to the model of communism and socialism that we found in Fundamental Principles. And the first way is kind of like, that book doesn't really talk about what regulatory apparatuses there are going to be, really, right? Like, it just kind of says, like, we're not really concerned about that. We're just concerned with, like, the economics of all of this. But I'm interested to know what you think about, like, the way it attenuates variety to whatever those regulatory systems might be, whether that's, uh, you know, the council, the big council, or whether that's, like, you know, some sort of, like, extremely democratic, like, political system. It kind of doesn't really matter. But the way that the economy functions and attenuating variety seems to just be, like, purely workers' autonomy. And Beer talks about that in this. He basically just says, if we're serious about wanting to give workers, like, more autonomy, uh, we need to actually do that. And we should because it's a way of attenuating variety because who knows better uh, how to run their businesses than workers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, yeah, how do you attenuate something as complicated as trying to, like, run a logically planned economy globally? Well, you just kind of let the people who know what they're doing do it. You know what I mean? Um, and then in terms of, like, the other way where variety is heading from the regulator to the system that's being regulated, I was doing some thinking about, like, how how that book attempts to solve the problem of, like, variety amplification. And I don't know if this is insane, but I was thinking a lot about, like, just the unit of account that they use, about, like, necessary labor time or, you know, labor time on average or whatever you want to call it. And it just seems that, like, the transparency of that unit of account really allows for variety amplification. Because, like, right now, well... Once, once you use that unit of account and you're able to, like, demystify everything and demystify, you know, right now you have no idea how much of your work is equivalent to, like, a pair of shoes. You can kind of guess because of the price signal, but you don't actually really know. But once you demystify all of that, like, it really allows for, like, autonomy to be put back into the system, right? Because it's like, oh, you amplify variety just using the simple unit of account where suddenly you're able to make rational decisions in your community and by yourself about not just consumption, but about planning, right? Like, it's a huge way of almost not even needing to have some kind of regulatory body in this, in this uh, like, example, because you're just able to basically, like, give people the tools to amplify their own knowledge and amplify their own variety, where it's like, oh, I'd like to make a bridge. This is going to cost, you know, X unit of accounts. I know exactly what that means. I don't know if that's necessarily like kind of what he was talking about, but yeah, I don't know. It really made me think a lot more about that damn book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you are correct in the analogies you draw between the two texts. I, I, think, um, I think I think you're onto something. He's all about decentralization, right? Mm. Like that's his big how do we how do we inject more variety into our system so that we're able to better regulate the the variety that the system is trying to attenuate, I suppose. Um, you stop trying to make all the decisions at one level mm. because he said like a, a, a sort of central authority that makes all the plan, do, that executes all of the planning, um, controls the system in its entirety, just cannot have the knowledge necessary to regulate the system in a way which is timely enough to forestall the crisis kind of thing and so he he basically just what it just says decentralize it to the people who know what's going on at the levels of which at which they are working and a lot of this comes back to the idea of recursion right which mm. is something that he talks about in this text quite a lot whereby in any sort of viable system any viable system is actually built out of lots of sub units which are also viable systems in and of themselves and so at any level where decisions can be made autonomously at that level those decisions should be made at that level kind of thing so you're not generating all this excess variety by just passing every question every concern up the chain of command to have it come back down the chain of command kind of thing. One of the ways you keep all this variety out of the system is to deal with things at the levels at which the decisions need to be made. Now, at the same time, he's very willing to say, well, we're going to need some amount of central regula regulation. Somebody's going to have to map out the entire system and have some idea, at least um, vaguely, what this system looks like when it is functioning properly, when it is resilient to 
variation enough to continue functioning kind of thing. And at that, the, 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 at that upper level, um, certain decisions will need to be made there kind of thing. So it's not mm. full decentralization. It's just spread the variety out and use the variety that's generated at all these levels as the offsetting variety to the variety that the system is trying to control, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like the other thing is just information and knowledge. Mm. Um, people need to have the knowledge necessary to make make decisions accurately and in a timely enough fashion to for their actions to not be too late kind of thing yeah um in a coordinated way yes quite. yeah 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 because yeah. Yeah, i got from it that like it, he's basically also trying to say that like it's almost a false dichotomy to bring up decentralization and centralization because he says right that like a fully decentralized system isn't a system. It's just a series of like free floating things that have nothing to do with each other. But then a fully centralized system, the centralized aspect of it would just get overwhelmed immediately and it just wouldn't function. So it isn't even like really what we have now, right? Because it's fully impossible. I mean, like you hear, you know, the totalitarian USSR stuff, but it's like, hey, like how, how much of what you consumed if you're living in the Soviet Union was just from the black market. You know what I mean? Like nothing can ever really be fully centralized. So yeah, it is interesting. I mean, like, the communication aspect of it is really, really important, isn't it? It's like the system too, because like at your firm or whatever, yeah, you just need to be focused on what you're doing and you'll do it the best. But like there needs to be a way to communicate with other firms, but then also to, you know, what does he call it? The signal that gets sent up to the top, the algodonic signal. Mm -hmm. Like that's just what the centralized aspect does. They just deal with the problems, nothing else, because that's what they're made to do and that's what they're good at doing. They're not good at, you know, micromanaging and sorting every little thing out for itself. That's for like, for the example of the body, the heart's going to beat, you know, the feet are going to walk or whatever. And if they ever need, I don't know why if the foot and the heart would ever need to like be in communication. But if they, hey, if they wanted to just to say hi, there's like this system that is able to like coordinate between them. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting. It's like, it is really a false dichotomy because it's like, yeah, it's just coordination and problem solving and autonomy. It's, it's almost seems like very simple, like, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> like when you read it like that, it's like, oh yeah, that's the way to do it. There's a certain amount to which this text is very dated by its being uh, written in the early 70s and some ways in which it is incredibly prescient. One of the things that he's really keen to try and expose his audience to is to the ways in which uh, new technologies for the 1970s <laughs> are going to be incorporated into the system and are being incorporated into the system. And he... Um, talks about computer technologies and he talks about communication technologies. It's funny that the two of those never come together. They're both yeah. always separate and we now live in a world where communication and computer technologies are basically one kind of thing. Mm. Um, the telex machine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the other thing he wants to introduce his audience to is uh, cybernetics, right? What mm. he calls the science of effective organization. And he's talking about the ways in which people are very off put by this technology in the early 70s they're very kind of like cautious of it um and one of the things that i found really enjoyable about this text i didn't really understand it initially and when i came to understand it i thought it quite useful he's constantly talking about how these tools of regulation of variety are always being used in the wrong mm way in the wrong part of the system they're actually being used by bureaucrats and by governments to generate excess variety rather than being used to regulate variety, I guess. But the way in which this is really prescient, it gets to a point where it's like, well, these things are just going to have to be free. Computer technology is just going to have to be free for everyone. And communications technology is just going to be going to have to be available for everyone and free for everyone. And it sort of makes me wonder how he would look at our present day communication technologies and sort of perceive them as being grossly misused, I suppose, in the mm. sense that they don't... Um, foster the kind of uh, transmission of information that you were talking about before, but rather seek to basically just confuse us and bombard us with too much information. Yeah. Um, we came across something like that when, we were, when we've talked about like the Brenner debates a bit, right? Where it's like, you can't just have a fully technologically determinist view of things because it's like, wow, can you imagine, how, like if somebody in Rome was like, could you imagine how great things would be if we all used the water wheel? We'd all have so much free time and we'd all, you know, be able to just sit down and relax. And it's like, okay, you can invent that. You can invent the cotton gin, but 
you know, everybody can have a computer, but if the social relations don't change, it's like, <laughs> hey, capitalism with computers. Now everybody is just like, you know, go to work, look at the bad computer, come home, look at the <laughs> good computer. You know, I live a good reference to the sort of transformation, the, the, the uh, transition debates. <laughs> uh, so I, I like that analogy a lot. But yeah, you're quite right. Like the technology is only um, as useful as the nature of the social relations under which that technology is being put to use, right? Mm. And what he's describing actually is new technology is being put to use in the system that is the social relations of capitalism in that period of time kind of thing. Mm. And it's being used to reinforce the pre-existing power dynamics to empower the present, the, the pre-existing bureaucracies both state and corporate kind of thing, mm. uh, rather than being used as liberatory Tools technologies. of liberation. Liberty yeah. machines. Liberty machines. My indeed. computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because he also makes an argument that like kind of, I suppose, doesn't have much to do with class about technology when he's just like what you were saying about it being used on the wrong side of the variety attenuation amplification problem because – you know, he was coming from a time where it's like not every firm has a computer and then it's like slowly like, oh, we got some telex machines. We got some of this. But he's like, I'm being, I'm seeing computers being introduced in entirely the wrong way because it's like, OK, now the schmuck at his job who already had too much to deal with gets the variety basically like amplified to him. And he's like, oh, man, I, you know, it's like when you're working in an office job and you just feel like a computer is giving you too much information instead of black boxing the information and getting it like you just don't need it. That's what he's talking about, because it's like. Computers should be used to attenuate variety, not to just amplify it at the regulator, right? I mean, I suppose you could also use computing technology to amplify variety away from the regulator. Um, I know I've seen on um, Tom, ex-guest of the show, Tom's podcast recently, he was talking about ways in which you could use some of this technology in like a fundamentally principles-y kind of way, right? Um, so that's kind of a way in which you could use, like he talked about like the blockchain to, uh, what is it like track labor hours, right? Uh, between firms, that's kind of a way you could use it to amplify variety, but he's basically just saying right now, all we're doing is putting it on the wrong side of it. So we're just giving managers and giving workers just like way too much information until they just get overwhelmed. Um, and I deal with that quite a bit. <laughs> so I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. He's talking about, right, coming back to like the. The liberty machine idea, which we've come about come across before when we were talking about cybernetic revolutionaries, right? Liberty is is a concept of a liberty machine. It's just the way you would organize a state apparatus to uh, ensure freedom and liberty. That's its um, output state. As, a, it's as its liberty. output state. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically what he attempted to construct in Chile, right? So if you go and look at cybernetic revolutionaries and look at the like four departments of... Uh, that's the cybersyn system that he was trying to put in place. Um, they map on very much to this sort of like liberty machine model that he's describing. You're going to, you've got to um, do the various types of modeling necessary to know what you're looking for in your system as being aberrant and what things are within various tolerances kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, he says, well, you could just like process all the wrong data in all the wrong ways. You could get all these different complicated models, which just obscure things like your manager or your boss or the government or the the minister minister in a government department could just order a new model that says something that closer to what we want it to do, like rejig the data in a way which which uh, aligns more with what we're expecting to have happen kind of thing. So you can use all of these technologies in a way both the computer technologies and the concepts of cybernetics and the modeling of cybernetics to add excess variety into the system in a way which actually um, brings it closer to this sort of like catastrophic point of collapse kind of thing. You mm. can add variety by using these technologies, which is perturbing the equilibrium rather than helping bring it back toward a state of relaxation kind of thing. And he's saying we need to use these things um, to aid systemic relaxation not mm -mm. not uh the systemic catastrophe i suppose that is on the horizon <laughs> what this what these arguments made me think about actually was um debates around social media at present because like i've always been really turned off by these ideas of like oh the toxic discourse on social media you know is social media like uh 
the sole culprit of how dysfunctional our civil so, um, civil society is at present. And of course, that's not the case. But it also made me think about like, there is some truth to that kind of argument in that we do have these communication technologies, and they are being used to amplify all the wrong types of variety. They don't deliver accurate information in a way that we can actually use. It's all just sort of like, perturbing the system rather than bringing it closer to relaxation kind of thing. This is every Adam Curtis movie. <laughs> <laughs> Social media. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm really interested in like how these ideas can actually be applied. One, because I'm interested in like the premise of all of this, that if you have a system that isn't viable and it's leading towards a collapse especially when we talk about our current institutions, like how realistic is it to think that there is this big collapse coming because of the bureaucratic ossification of like the IRS? You know what I mean? I know that that's kind of dumbing things down. But also like, I'm just interested in, it seems very clear how you could apply these ideas to a socialist society, right? Like the fundamental principle stuff or just using this as like a critical framework for designing any kind of new system. But I'm also interested in like, how you could apply these um, under capitalism now. And that got me thinking about like ways you could organize something that would resemble a political party. Um, and it got me thinking about the uh, Mike McNair, because I think he was really onto something that was kind of similar to this when he talks about how he would organize his political party, right? Which is like extremely democratic based on the community, not just like waged industrial workers or whatever. And that really got me interested in how you could apply a viable system model to that kind of like political party operating under capitalism. And it seems to me like you would have to do something like what McNair is saying, which is like base it around the community. Um, everybody's got their own problems. Everybody has to bring their problems to the party or whatever you want to call it, the like organization. And that organization, that regulatory body seems like it has to operate as kind of like a, this is going to get a bit technical, but like as kind of like a system, perhaps three, four and five. And then everything else is just like allowing people to be active in the struggles that they, that are in their like theater, right? Whether that's like uh, working with, I don't know, homeless people or like tenant strikes or uh, like actual union strikes at, uh, you know, I don't know, like some fucking like a uh, university or something like that. Imagine that. But the thing that's important then if we're using this to organize something like that under capitalism now would be what you were saying about like the communication and like the system two and also like the algodonic system stuff because it's like if you just try and set up like a trot sect you're just gonna have maybe a system four and that's it <laughs> you know what i mean but it's like if you at least use mcnair as a jumping off point and you're able to kind of be like well we need to bring everybody's struggles into this because you know law of requisite variety the only reason the working class is the thing that needs to liberate the working class because it's the only thing that can, right? It's the only thing that has enough variety. But it's like, how then do you coordinate all of those activities in a meaningful way? And it really seems like what I've settled on is creating some sort of communication channel that is able to like coordinate all of these activities. How that's actually done, I don't know. Mm. But um, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've, we've sort of touched on this idea before or sort of pushed toward it. Kind of the notion that you cannot, like, obviously, you say that, like, the Trot sect or even, like, the Leninist, part, the Leninist party form in the sort of, like, post-1923 model is very, like, the democratic centralist, right? Mm -hmm. Or even, like, the bureaucratic centralist kind of thing. Like, it really emphasizes power and authority at the top and everybody is um, subject to that power and authority, which isn't a model of a party which is going to scale into something that we would... Mm -hmm. in any way described as a mass party but any, any also anything that would ever deserve the name like a workers party or a proletarian party or, or that whatever. would set up anything resembling anything other than a bureaucratically democratic centralist government yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, McNair yeah. says right it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's yeah, just yeah, to be yeah. the party Yeah. Mm. but there is also the other end of the spectrum which is like how do you set up a system which allows enough freedom inside of a party for all of the sort of variety that all of the people that bring into that party, all of that variety that all those people bring into that party, which is necessary to 
for that party to have functioning relationships with people outside of it, right? Like the the function of a mass party is that it actually is society in microcosm. And you can think about that idea in terms of variety. We've sort of talked about mm. this before, right? Like the party is trying to accrue variety by bringing in members so that it's much more functional and effective in its operations. But there is also this question of taking a political party as a system, a system which has a certain outcome in mind, right? It wants to function yeah. in a way which is moving society towards socialism, mm -hmm. I suppose. Like, how do you ensure that is the continuing goal of that kind of organization? And I guess, I don't know, I don't know how, mm. I mean, there are ways of t talking about this in terms of like the the five tiers of Stafford Beer's um, viable system model, right? There is a portion of the system, is it like system four, which is like designed to keep the system's goal in mind. Exactly, yeah. Um, and ensure that the system continues to strive toward a particular goal. Mm. That's a way of thinking about it in a very abstract way. But what does that functionally look like in mm. a real world uh, party? I don't know. Yeah. I guess the other way to look, think about it from a sort of vaguely Marxist perspective is to say, well, we have some kind of faith that the working class is sort of like natural political instinct is to strive toward certain liberatory outcomes, I suppose. So there is a way that you could look at it, which would just be by very virtue of the fact that you were empowering working class people uh, to assert um, their political power, you would necessarily be promoting that outcome, the mm. desirable outcome. I don't know how much I believe that necessarily, well, but I think, one yeah. could construct an, answer, an argument around that idea, I think. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And it's a really good point because, like, there's a fine line between, like, I don't know. That's that's kind of not really the question, right? It's not really, like, well, the working class is natural proclivity towards liberation because, like, well, okay, if you just take that uh, idea, then perhaps you're just going to wind up – your organization that you've set up is just going to wind up becoming either an entryist or reformist or whatever because, like, I don't know. Like, we're not anarchists, right? We are communists, so it's like we – have an idea in mind, as you're saying, about moving towards socialism. So, like, how do you balance that? Perhaps we're going to alienate X percentage of people by having this goal in mind with, but also the system that we set up isn't just going to collapse into just becoming Labour Party 2. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, that's in the, and in that sense, it's an organizational question. It doesn't really have anything to do with, like, the natural proclivity of the workers, right? Because, like, yeah, everyone's good. Everybody gets it. Everybody complains. Like, but it is more so about, like, how do you create this system that is dynamic and survives and doesn't just get set to that trap of reformism, entryism, trot sectism on the other end, right? Like, yeah. And I think in that sense, it's an organizational question. And yeah, again, it seems like you're going to probably alienate some people if you do that. If you have this set goal in mind, if you're system four and you're five or like doing the forward planning or whatever, but like you need to at a certain point. That is the big question of like, how do you organize a system that has that goal in mind? And yeah, I don't know. Without, yeah, there needs to be some aspect of like, no, but here's what we're going to do. You know, um, it's tricky to do that without just either, I don't know. The easy way to do it would just be like, yeah, it's a central committee of like five white guys and they just figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know. That would, just, yeah. And then that would wind up being disaster anyways, because that's not an organization that you want to be in any kind of power either. Right. So I don't know. I guess it's worth reiterating that the, the successful organization that contributed to the outcome that was the 1917 revolution functioned in a non uh, hierarchical way, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. I suppose, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something new, I think, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see. It'll be very interesting. It'll be very interesting to see, like... I like to be an optimist. I like to think that the transition is eventually going to happen. But, like, you know, what is the organizational form that's going to get us there? Because this is a great framework, but it's also, like... Yeah, the main question, then, along with that communication and coordination channel is how do you do forward planning without alienating everybody? I suppose just a lot of like concrete work on the ground, right? And a lot of convincing people and a lot of like, yeah, 
you know, it would make there be no homeless people. You mm-hmm. know, it would make it so that you wouldn't have to have a trade union and blah, 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 blah. What are you going to do? Um, yeah, that's rocked. Very much so. I'd like to read more of this fellow, <laughs> um, this weird chocolate-eating, cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking uh, Englishman. Um, and we should also go to his uh, uh, weird cottage in Wales. I think that'd be really yeah, interesting. Yeah, did you discover that you can go and visit? <laughs> is it still in existence? As it is, museum? yeah. Just okay. this weird cottage with like okay. weird runes on the walls yeah. and like sayings. And Maybe stuff we like can that. go on our way to William Morrissey's house. Yes. After, we, after we go and visit <laughs> William Morrissey's house. Yeah. We can go and see Stafford Beer's <laughs> cottage in Wales. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, see his random thrones and goblets. And, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'd probably wind up stealing one of Stafford Beer's goblets, if I'm being <laughs> honest. Um, yeah, yeah, freedom. We like it, folks. We like freedom and we like liberty. Um, and we would perhaps like to do with more of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I think we're both feeling a big <laughs> lack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could do with some more liberty, I think. Um, all right. I don't know if there's too much else to say. This is one that, again, I know we make the joke a lot where it's like you uh, don't read what we're reading because then you realize how wrong we are or whatever. But, like, this is short. You, if you don't want to read it, you can listen to it. Go do it because uh, you'll discover things, I suppose, that we haven't said or that we've, hey, whoa, maybe even misconstrued. Um, although, I don't know about that. We are perfect. So, um, strongly suggest going to read this. And, yes, I like that we're beginning our path of not uh, of reading things that are about not just Marxology, uh-huh. but, you know, hey, the world. Wow. <laughs> Systems. It's a big thing. It's huh? scary, Jack. It's I don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Next week, some orthodox Marxology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Then we'll just be depressed. So, you know, that's uh, fine. We'll go back to that uh, recognizable feeling. <laughs> um, yeah. Next week, we'll solve inflation. Mm. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Mm. Um, all right. Well, uh you can go on our YouTube and find the interview we did with June, which is very cool. You can go watch us do that if you are some kind of sicko. Um, and go, go back through the archives and find the two episodes we did on yeah. cybernetic revolutionaries. There's Indeed. a lot of overlap with this. Yeah. Um, and I was really pleased to come back to these ideas because it's been a long time since we've, yeah. um, we've dealt with them. And they are vital. And I've forgotten their vitality. Mm. But um, my interest is revitalized yeah well it's also like in cybernetic revolutionaries it was very like in the research we did for the viable systems model video it was very like here is what a system looks like on a page and it's like okay you can understand that but this is a lot more like i don't want to say like humanist but it's a lot more like it brings it back down to earth and it's like well this is what that would actually look like um so yeah it i think made me finally understand it um Mm -hmm. to a certain extent yeah so, yes, YouTube, all of that, Discord, uh, you can message us on there. If you want the link, let us know. It'll probably be in the description or something like that. Uh, and then we'll be back with something else. Great. Uh, no idea what it'll be, but it'll be so good. <laughs> You'll right. find out when we do. Yeah, exactly. yeah, probably. We are recording this the night before this is due to go up in the morning. So it is pretty close to us finding out at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. right. Well, there you go. Well, uh, this has been fun, Dan. And I've been Jack, and this has been a show. <laughs> this has been a show. Uh, I've enjoyed recording it very much. It's been nice to get back to it. We haven't done this in a little while. Mm. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Jack, for having this discussion with me. All right. Cheerio. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>you heard this episode was music to kill bad people to by king gizzard and the lizard wizard if you like this song you can check it out and much much more on their band camp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com be sure and follow us up on instagram twitter and facebook and if you like what you heard be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion till next time